Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, our call to worship is from Psalm 62. Now, the immediate context of this psalm, it was probably inspired by David's son Absalom's rebellion. The rebels with, with Absalom were out to shatter David and cast him down from his position as king. And all David could do was basically run and hide and be still and wait silently on God alone, the only true refuge, his only source of deliverance. And verse 5 kind of captures the theme of this psalm. It says, Let all that I am wait quietly for God, for my hope is in him. Now, just as it was a time for David to, to be still, to wait silently before God and to hope in him alone, I would suggest that this is exactly how we need to behave in the midst of this situation that we currently find ourselves in. God alone is our rock and our fortress in this period of difficulty, and from him alone our salvation will come, in his own time, in his own way, and according to his own purposes. He alone has the power to deliver us from all evil, and in the meanwhile we wait quietly and confidently for him to act, and we will not be shaken. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Psalm 62. I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. So many enemies against one man, all of them trying to kill me. To them I'm just a broken down wall or a tottering fence. They plan to topple me down from my high position. They delight in telling lies about me. They praise me to my face, but curse me in their hearts. Interlude. Let all that I am wait quietly before the Lord, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. O oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. Interlude. Common people are as worthless as a puff of wind, and the powerful are not what they appear to be. If you weigh them on the scales together, they are lighter than a breath of air. Don't make your living by extortion or put your hope in stealing. And if your wealth increases, don't make it the centre of your life. God has spoken plainly, and I have heard it many times. Power, O oh God, belongs to you. Unfailing love, O oh Lord, is yours. Surely you repay all people according to what they have done. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, it is a joy again to gather together as your people under your perfect, uh, holy, inerrant, all-sufficient word. Father, to just be uh, filled again, Lord, with the, the, the encouragement, the strength that your word brings us. So, Lord, we, we just thank you, Lord, for this is one of our greatest of all blessings, Lord, that we can sit under your word and that your Holy Spirit can lead us into all truth. Thank you, Father. Father, thank you for every person out there watching uh, this evening. Father, we, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead us to apply your word in our own circumstances and there are probably many, many circumstances out there, many, many needs at this time. And Lord, we know that you, you do, do not abandon us in our need. Lord, you comfort us, you strengthen us. Sometimes you chastise us, but it is all for our own ultimate good because you are a good father to us all. So Lord, we commit this evening to you, Lord, the the, the preaching of the word, Father, the, um, everything that's said and done, Lord, we, we ask that you would bless in Jesus' precious name to each and every one of us. Amen. Well, Church, we now come to share in the word.
hear from God through the preaching of the Word, can you please open up the, the book of 1 Thessalonians? Last week, we started our series started our series in the book of Acts, uh, which begins our, our uh, preaching through the book of 1 Thessalonians, because in Acts, we saw the gospel uh, go to Thessalonica through the missionaries. We saw the church start, and then it's to them later that Paul writes this. So we're open up to 1 Thessalonians, very keen to preach through it. it. We've titled this series, How You Ought to Walk. We see in Thessalonians just a great example for the church. And we see as well, Paul commanding them how they ought to walk. And so from this, this passage, this letter, we will receive much instruction, example, encouragement, exhortation, and rebuke on how we as Christians in a local church should be living and walking. So this is exciting. Before we do, I want to encourage you, uh, download our app. That's where you're going to be able to get all, it's free, and all our uh, teaching content is on there, but also notifications will come through there. Uh, there's, and especially, I want to suggest that because there's a, um, a section on the app where you can put in your prayer requests, and that'll get emailed through uh, to myself and Vic, uh, or you can uh, sign up there and become a, a member on the app, not a member of church, but a member of the app, and that uh, just lets you get some emails and uh, and your, your, your details go onto our list. So uh, over 100 people have downloaded that app so far, which is great, but just encourage you to get it. Um, there's extra teaching on there as well. The most recent one that went up was our, our teaching series on the, the defense and the definition of the New Testament canon, a uh, bit of an apologetic for how did we get the books that we have in our New Testament, and how can we be sure that the right ones were picked. Uh, so that'll be helpful for you. Um, and as well, uh, on there we are those the, the information on the different ministries we have that we want to be engaging in. So Tuesday and Thursday mornings on Zoom, we are praying together. And I just want to encourage you to get along there. Uh, if you're up at that time, it'll be a great time to join. It's Tuesday and Thursday mornings, 6.30 till 7, as we pray for our nation, our church, our, our uh, lost loved ones, as well as um, if you're also if you're not up at that time, if you couldn't get up at that time and come and pray with us, that would be a blessing to you and to me and to our world as we pray. Uh, but as well, uh, join a fellowship group online, a virtual fellowship group over Zoom or uh, different groups are joining in different ways. If you're not in one, just message us in uh, and we'll, uh, we'll find one that you can go into. Uh, there's a couple that have sort of formed. Uh, and so, so we'd love for you to just be in each other's pockets, looking after each other, encouraging each other and hanging out online, whatever that looks like. Uh, lastly, Monday night, it is our, our joy to be going through the book of Knowing God by J.I. Packer and breaking down each chapter, uh, looking at what scriptural lessons of theology and practice in our life practice we can learn from J.I. Packer. And I'm teaching that, so please join us on Zoom. If you want to join and you're not in our Facebook group, message us. We can send you that link. If you want to be a part of Hope, then uh, message us and we can add you into our Hope uh, Facebook group, that private group. Uh, otherwise, check us out on Instagram and Facebook to get all our content going there. So 1 Thessalonians, let's, let's open up here and I'm going to read our section today and then we're going to break it down as we go back through it. Today's sermon is entitled, The Power of the Gospel. And we'll start in chapter 1, verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Greetings, Paul, Sil uh, Silvanus, Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and your labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. When you go from verse 1 through to halfway there in verse 5, and may God bless us as we do this. I wanted to ask the question tonight, as, as we see the the triumph of the gospel in the book of Acts as it 
power's on and cities are turned upside down and the gospel flourishes. Churches are planted and grow, but never without opposition. Always the devil is attacking the glory of God on earth, which is the church, his bride, most beloved possession in existence. But we saw that last week, the, the journey, the second missionary journey of Paul, Silas, and Timothy as they went and planted churches. They went to Macedonia, planted there, especially in Thessalonians, uh, among the Thessalonians. Well, it's encouraging. I want to just be encouraged by that for a moment, that, that all the toil and all the difficulty that we read of last week that Paul went through with his men, the suffering, the imprisonments, the beatings, the riding hundreds of kilometers, the being rejected from cities and cast out and, and not allowed to come back. All of this happened, and yet, as he writes, Paul Silvanus, which is another name for Silas, we can just use that word, as I probably accidentally will, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. This is exciting. And at the end of all of that, they did produce by their labor, the work of the Spirit, the grace of God, the work of the Word. There is a church in existence in Thessalonica because of their work. At the end of it all, he, he, he sends back Timothy as he's down in Athens. He sends Timothy, go to Thessalonica, find out, is there a church in existence anymore? Are they all dead? Did they all depart from the faith as the Jews persecuted them? Or are they there in truth and in love, in hope, faith, and, and love. And, and Timothy comes back and gives an amazing report, saying to, to, to Paul, yes, they're alive, they're flourishing, they love Jesus, it's amazing. Our work had productive effect in that city. So this is exciting. Paul, Sil Silas, Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians. Now I want to ask, what is the power of the gospel? We're going to be asking some questions about the power of the gospel because there are so many ways that so many fools and, and so many people who are just maybe ignorant and, and blissfully ignorant or people who, who aim too high and define it wrongly will, will define this in an incorrect way, that the gospel power in the church. And we heard quite helpfully from Vic last week in the morning about false ways that churches attempt to have an influence and attempt to display and walk in power. There are all sorts of ways that uh, people chase miracles and chase um, uh, 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 social, uh, cha uh, you know, city-changing social gospel uh, directions. And we just want to put all that to the side and say, what does the Scripture say? What is it that, and we're going to be asking these questions, what is the source of gospel power? What is the effect that gospel power has upon people what is the certainty of that gospel power to work? And how does gospel power look as it's operating? We're going to ask these questions because this is good questions for Christians to want to know. Maybe you're new to the faith. Maybe uh, you've been walking in with Christ for a long time, but you're new to this church. Maybe you just love reading scripture. You've gone through 1 Thessalonians before, but we're going to be asking the question, what is this power of the gospel? How does it work? What does it look like? What's the source of it in all these ways? So join with me as we study. Look at the end of verse 1. And point 1 tonight is, what is the source of gospel power? Well, Paul writes to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The power, the source of this church, the reason that it can receive so much affliction, the reason it can be attacked so young, it's almost this picture of, of this, this church as it's just been born, a fresh new baby, and the Jews and the, the world around are trying to kill it. It's, it's like Moses from the Old Testament being born right at the time that Pharaoh had promised to kill every newborn male. He's born right into that terrible, treacherous situation, and so it is with the Thessalonians. Their church was birthed and now newborn, sitting on the table with enemies surrounding, trying to kill them. What made them survive, thrive, and stay alive to the day that, that Paul would be able to write to them? 
It was the fact that this church is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a matter of location, but a matter of union. They were those who were at Thessalonica, but they were in God the Father and in Jesus Christ. This is not just a matter of location, but life source. The source of all sustenance, the head of their church, that which is able to keep them from falling is God. And that is a church in God that has gospel power. A couple of things about the Thessalonians. They were, they were a young, young, young church, less than a year. No matter, how, I mean, it, it, Paul was a sh- very short time, anywhere from two weeks to at most six months in Thessalonica, and it was only a few months later that he's hearing about them. This is a church that is very young, so not lots of mature, aged believers here. So that they've been a church, they've all been Christians for less than a year. Imagine those members' meetings, right? You think your members' meetings get a little bit heated. Imagine if nobody here was more than a year old in Christ. I would pay to see that. I would love to sit in on one of those meetings. Nonetheless, they're a young church. They've all got new relationships with each other. They weren't friends before this. In fact, they are from very different cultural, economical situations. Some of them were Pharisees, right? Learned, teaching Jews from the, uh, the, the synagogue. Some of them were Gentiles, worshipping demons, sacrificing their firstborn to, the, uh, to their gods of the time. Right? The, 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 this is a, a, from opposite ends of the spectrum. Some of them were political leaders. Some of them were slaves. And they're all in this one church. This is glorious, but it's messy. And they came about amidst affliction and persecution. All that they knew of the Christian life was opposition. They were not struggling with gospel clarity. They knew the gospel well, but there was confusion on some other theological points, including prophecy. There seemed to have been a bit of a mess around that back in chapter, uh, chapter 5. Um, and so there's, there's a lot that's not going well for this church. I would even say that the, the, their elders, they have elders who have been saved for less than a year, who came into their job in quite a mess of a situation, Uh, so much affliction against them. So this is not a church that you would uh, put all those things on a checklist when you're looking for your ideal church. Is it? This is not a church like that. And yet, it's a church worth rejoicing over because they have gospel power from the source of all good things, Jesus Christ and His Father, our God. A church can be young. A church can be messy. A church can still have people living in their sin, needing discipline. A church can be struggling over theological points, but if they have focus on the gospel, if they are sustained by gospel preaching, if they preach the gospel to the world and they grow in the gospel, it is God alone that is the source of that and it is God who will secure and preserve them going forward. So what is the source of gospel power? It's God. Only a church in God has gospel power. And that is why in verse 2 you'll notice he says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. He doesn't thank the Thessalonians. He doesn't congratulate the Thessalonians. And here's an example for us, something that we should uh, emulate. He thanks God for the Thessalonians. He's not congratulating the new Christians for doing well, preserving themselves. He's saying, God is the source of all. I praise him for you. This isn't about you. It's about God, but he has done a great work in you. He goes on. So we've seen what the source of gospel power is, but I want to look at what effect that gospel power has on people. You and me, dead in our sin, when the gospel comes to us, powerfully works in us, what does it do to us? What traits do we show after it's come? Well, verse 3. We are rem- they're praying for the Thessalonians, remembering before our God and Father your, number one, work of faith. Number two, labor of love. 
Number three, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see those? One, two, three. And they're the, they're the trifecta, right? These are popular throughout the New Testament. Faith, hope, and love. You know 1 Corinthians 13. There, are, there is faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of all these is love. You know that quote. This is not just a, a pithy, a little catchphrase that Christians throw together, okay? And, and I want to talk about faith, hope, and love, or in the order that Paul gives it tonight, faith, love, and hope. I want to talk about them, look at them, what they really mean, because I think in our time, they've, they've just become, and no offense to the ladies here, but they have become quite feminized. You know, they've, they've, they've faith, love, hope, or faith, hope, love, that they've become sort of a wooden piece of decor that, that housewives might put on the, on the wall coming into the entry. They're, 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 they're stickers that teenage girls might get and chuck on the front of their Bible. Faith, hope, love. And it's not that they're girly or, or womanly. I think womanly is, is a godly strength. I mean that it's feminine. They've, they've become kind of weak words, right? No, no man is, is wanting to put on his profile or his, his resume or, or uh, that, that he, he, he embodies faith, hope, and love. When's the last time, right? Do you think that your plumber's going to come to your house to do some work and he might and as his shirt slips up he'll have a little tattoo on his ribs faith hope love probably not probably not a common one for manly men and and i think that that's a problem i want to look at them and show how faith hope love are strong demanding godly wonderful powerful traits in order to embody let's um let's look at this (laughs) let's break it down a little bit more we have uh, all through, uh, you know, we have Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 13, Galatians 5, Colossians 1, Hebrews 6, 1 Peter 1. These are just examples of where the apostles' writings say that the Christians are or should embody faith, hope, and love. So these are not just, as I said before, just throwaway lines. These are what true Christians embody. Faith, hope, and love. We're going to look at their glory right now. What does gospel power do to people when it comes? It starts with the work of faith. So you'll notice he doesn't just say faith, hope, love, or faith, love, hope. He says work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope. He's pairing, he's pairing the, the, the traits, the faith, love, and hope. He's putting it together with what that thing produces. Do you see that? I can, you know, we're remembering before our God your faith, or maybe your version, if you've got an NIV, it probably says your faith which produces works, your love which produces labor, your hope which produces steadfastness. And that's a fair way to translate it. <coughs> not, not entirely faithful to the Greek, but it is true that each of these words is produced by that which it is paired with. So let's look first at faith. Faith, your work of faith. He doesn't mean that you're trusting in Jesus by faith, that one thing that you do in order to be transferred from enemy to child of God, and that's all it was. You shifted your faith from self, your faith from this world, to Christ and said, I trust Him, not myself. I trust Him for my forgiveness, redemption, to be my Lord. I trust God in Jesus Christ. When you did that, you were saved. That's not the work that is being spoken about. Work is not faith. Faith is not work. What is what is actually the word work here means means uh, labor. It's usually used in the Greek in the first century to mean like farming, agriculture. That hard labor and work. That's the word that's used. Um, That is what it means. Is let's think about it in the sense of repentance. Your work of faith is that turning from sin and now living, working in a different way than when you were prior, uh, before sinning. You used to sin, now your work is holiness. It's righteousness. It's obeying Jesus. It's living like Jesus. So this is your work of faith. Now usually, this is strange, usually Paul, when he's writing, he will put these two words away from each other and against each other. He will say, we are saved by faith, not by works. And, and, then, and he stresses that to such a point that, 
he always ends up having to come back and swing the other way a little bit and recorrect and say, I'm not saying you never have to work. You do. All true Christians will work. All true Christians will repent of sin, become like Jesus. But, but Paul makes such a big distinction that he has to say that at the end because he says, faith is apart from works. You're not saved a single iota or ounce because of what you did. It's all Jesus received by faith. But in this text, he doesn't do that. He doesn't have to do that. Because when he's writing to the Thessalonians, there is no confusing, uh, confusion. There's no heresy of justification by works in Thessalonica. And there's also no confusion about repentance. He doesn't need to teach them to repent. He doesn't need to teach them that it's only by faith. They know that. And they're walking in this beautiful harmony of faith and works. The powerful gospel comes, and as Titus 3 tells us, it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and lusts and to live upright and godly lives. So if the gospel has come to you and you believe you've had faith, you've believed, but your life has not left your sin, has not walked away from unrighteousness, you still sit there in it, living amongst it. You, friend, have not experienced the true power of the gospel, but only a half gospel. And a half gospel does not save you. You need the full gospel, the powerful gospel of repentance from your dead works and coming to life in good works towards Jesus because you had faith that is apart from works. So he commends them on that, and it is to be commended. And then he says, the labor of love. Labor of love. This word labor, this is not, uh, this is not a, a, an easy going word. Its Greek word means labor, toil, fatigue, to the point of weariness. Okay, imagine you've run a 10K. I've never run that. I did. I did. I did once. I stopped about 20 times. But imagine you run a 10K early in the morning. You cross that line. Your legs are like jelly. You know the feeling. You can hardly walk. And imagine you get to your car, your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, the son, whoever has locked the keys in the car or, or, or the battery is flat. Something happens that you now need to push the car. Your leg's tired. You're already at the end of your extremity and you need to exert even more. That's the word picture. Endu uh, 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 enduring even while already fatigued. That's the picture of this labor. What labor is this that would be shown to one another and what does it come out of this deep affection of love for each other? In fact, that might be a fair translation of the words, a hard toil of deep affection for each other. So the Thessalonians are doing this. They're just young in the faith. They don't know a whole lot, but they know Jesus. They don't know how to live a whole lot like Christ, but, but they know him in the gospel, and they know if, if we know one thing about Jesus, it's he went to the end to love us. Let us go to the end to love one another in, in actual sacrificial toil, to help each other, serve one another, meet each other's needs. And that is what gospel power does in a people. Right, you and me, we are so naturally just bent towards our own selfishness, what we want, what we desire, what we deserve, what we want to make ourselves comfortable. And when the gospel comes in and shows us that for our sake, Christ became poor, for our sake, Christ labored hard, for our sake, Christ loved and gave his life for us, we simply are, are changed from the inside out to realize I love my brothers and sisters. Don't know them that well in Thessalonians. Right? They, they, don't, they haven't met each other a whole lot of time ago, six months maybe, but they know they love each other. They know they love this person. If Christ can die for you, then I can live for you. And they labor. And that's just one of the very easiest things to do in the Christian life is say that I don't labor lots. I don't break a sweat for my brothers and sisters. I don't go without in order that they can have. I don't do something sacrificially, but I do speak nicely. Friends, that's not love. That's not love the way that Paul thinks of it. Labor and love are the two sides to the same coin. 
your labor of love. So that without labor, there is no love. And without love, you will not be able to do that labor. You'll say, I, I think of people very positively. That's not love. Well, will I pray for people a lot? That's not love unless you seek to be used by God in the answer of those very prayers for other people. Love is labor. And so we see it in the Thessalonians. Let us see that among us. It's like that in Thessalonians. And I praise God it is like that so much here at Hope. But, but it must always be more. We, have, we hold back nothing for the love of the saints. So there's work of faith. There's a labor of love and there is steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope, let's define this. Hope is not a wish. Hope is not wishing, fingers crossed, that something good may happen. May not, may do, don't know, I'm just going to think the best, hope for the best. That's not how the Bible uses the word hope. Hope is an assurance about something. Being sure about something in the future that we just can't see yet, but I know it's happening. That's hope. And that's why it says, hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what Christians have as the source of our hope, as that which is our hope to look forward to, is Jesus returning to this world, undoing the curse and remaking it all, placing us in it for eternity as sin free reigners with him, kings and queens in the kingdom of God forever. No sin, no sickness, no suffering. Or we die and we go to be with him forever until he comes back and remakes all things. That's a glorious hope where you will be rewarded for every sacrifice, every labor of love, where you'll be rewarded for all that you've lost. <laughs> that is a true hope. That is a deep Hope that, that out, outweighs all other things. No matter what the situation is, no matter what the, the future looks like for you on earth, with that hope, you are uh, thinking brightly about the future. Christian, is that your hope? Do you intentionally put your mind to the future? Intentionally put your mind back to the cross and intentionally think, no matter what happens, no matter what I lose, no matter what I sacrifice, Christ died for me. He's coming back for me. The future is golden. Let me live for Jesus. Joy in my heart. Promises of God coming to me. The reality is when the gospel comes, it, it promises us what happened on the cross and it promises us what's going to happen in the future. And so the power of the gospel comes bringing dead men into works of faith and hating people into laborious love for each other, and it brings hopeless, depressed, joyless people to a joyful, expectant hope in all that is to come in Jesus Christ. And that produces something. Not just a joy, not just a smile when you think about the future, not just a, an expectation of what is to come, but as Paul says, hope produces steadfastness steadfastness. Now, now there is a, <clears throat> a danger to think that hope just means waiting. If I have hope for Jesus coming back, I'll buckle down, sit down and wait for him to come back. That's not the picture we get. And there's a, as you hear steadfastness or endurance, maybe you just think, and I'll really wait, no matter how long he takes, I'll rest here, wait, and, and he'll come, it'll be great. So the word endurance or steadfastness is a picture of somebody who is a soldier, not cowering under a rock waiting for his king to come. But the picture is an active endurance, a pressing forward to the end in battle, at the, the last of your energies, but still swinging the sword, pushing through the front line of the enemy, laboring, ongoing. It was the word that was so often used of the martyrs who died or those who were taken prisoners in war and died for their king, they showed a pushing forward endurance, steadfastness. In one sense, we're immovable. In another sense, we're always moving forward, but never moving back. And we don't get that without a 
hope in Jesus coming back. You cannot have that endurance without putting your mind to Jesus Christ, his coming in the future, the certainty of it. But if you have that, if by the gospel you put your mind to that, Christian, you will have a steadfastness. You are waiting for the return of the victorious Jesus to complete his will in this world. We can stand, we can run, we can labor in love, we can push against sin with our works of faith, we can build this kingdom, lead our family, establish our career, all of that in righteousness because I have endurance, faithfulness, steadfastness. That is what the power of the gospel does. And let me ask, at point three now, verse four, point three, verse four, what is the certainty of gospel power? Because it's true, I can say that the gospel will come and have effects in people and it'll be great, there's a certainty involved in this. What is the assurance that the gospel will have power? It is this. Verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Choosing. The choosing of God, what we call the doctrine of election. Often people call it the, this harsh, mean doctrine. You only tell to Christians who are in their faith for 10 20 years, but if they're young in the faith, don't mention election or predestination or Calvinism. <gasps> don't send them to a Reformed Baptist church. Don't do that. But, but we see, here at Hope, we see this as a letter written to young Christians encouraging them with the doctrine of election. It bracketed with the love of God. And when we say election, just for the, the new people, those who haven't come across this before, we mean that God, before he created the world, before sin came in and he made anybody, he picked certain people who he would make his own. And in this life, those chosen people and those chosen people alone come to salvation. That Christians are Christians because God picked you to be Christians. And you say, why did he choose me? Why did he choose us? And verse 4 tells us that you have been loved by God. That's the source of his choosing you. Well, what made him love you? Nothing. Nothing in you, I promise. Nothing about you is lovely. He didn't pick you because you're lovely. He picked you because he loved you. And he loved you simply because he loved you. And that is the most mysterious thing in all the world, that an eternal God seeing me for all I am can love me eternally. But he has. And this, this is an encouragement, not just to you, and I hope it is, and not just to the Thessalonians who are hearing this, and I hope, I know that it would have been to hear that I've been chosen by God. Well, his eternal choice cannot be undone by my situation, my weakness, my difficulty. If it was sure in the past and he chose me, it's sure forever. But there's also an assurance that comes to the preacher or to Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to, to preachers of the gospel like myself and all others. There is a certainty that the doctrine of election brings. And it's this kind of assurance, that whenever the gospel is preached, people will come to faith, people will be saved, churches will be planted, because God has chosen people. And those chosen people will, without failure, come to become Christians. At a moment, just maybe months later, um, in the, uh, the, from the point of Paul planting in Thessalonica, he runs away, remember, oh, he doesn't run away, he's pushed out, remember he's discouraged, he's alone, and later on God appears to him in a vision and said, do not be afraid, oh, church planning missionary Paul, don't be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. This is when he's in Corinth. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. God's telling the gospel preacher, Paul, don't be discouraged. Keep on preaching in Corinth, where they hate you, where they're attacking you. Keep on preaching, because I have chosen people who I have elected. They're here. They just haven't been saved yet. 
stay here, preach, people will come to faith. And the next line says, and Paul stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And people came to faith. That, that Paul, encouraged by the doctrine of election, could push through all things knowing God's people will hear God's voice and come to God's salvation, come to God's church, and God will get the glory. He is the source of this gospel power. And doctrine of election, his eternal love is the certainty that gospel power will take its right effect at the right time on the right people. That's the truth. If you were here, you would have just amen that. I know that. Number four. Number four. So we've seen the source of gospel power is that a church is in God the Father and Jesus Christ. We've seen that what the gospel power does in people is create works of faith, labors of love, and steadfastness in hope. The certainty of that is the fact that God has chosen his people. But lastly, what does the gospel power look like as it's operating? How does gospel power work? Well, we see this in verse 5. And this is how he knows they are, they are chosen, they are elect. Because our gospel came to you. Now, what, now, the gospel goes all around the world and to many different people, even in the book of Acts. Even in the same city of Thessalonica, of Thessalonica, many people heard, but they came to faith. There is a difference. This is how gospel power works. Our gospel came to you not only in word. Right, not only in word, but let me say, first of all, it did come in word. This shouldn't be said today. It shouldn't have to be said today. I shouldn't have to distinguish this, but friends, we do. We just we do, and so we will with joy that, that God's gospel, as it's preached, has to be preached with words that are understandable and rightly relate the truth of God to people's minds. And let me just say that walking around and doing miracles, praying for miracles, or or, or lengthening people's legs just to touch is not gospel preaching. If divorced from that is a clear enunciation of Jesus Christ dead on the cross for our sins, alive from the grave in resurrection, sitting on the throne of God to rule the world and getting glory for himself through the salvation of sinners who believe on him. That's gospel preaching. It comes in word. Not only word, as Paul says, but it has to be words. We don't get the what comes next, the Power, conviction, Holy Spirit. That doesn't accompany anything else than words. There must be words or there is none of this other stuff. The word is preached. Our gospel came to you in word, but not only in word, also in power. This word power is, is the word that we get dynamite from out of the Greek. Dunamis or dunamai in the Greek. This means that that this gospel came with uh, dynamite effect, this explosive effect in Thessalonica. And it did, didn't it? It did. When you read that account, it was explosive. But let me ask again, as so many people take that very word dunamis or dunamai and try and make that a pattern for ministry, because sometimes it means miracles in the New Testament, but here it does not. Do not think that the power of ministry is the displaying of the miraculous accompanying gospel preaching. We don't see any account of miracles in Thessalonica. Any. What we do see is power of another form. Power that is preaching with explosive effect, which is some people being resurrected out of their spiritual graves, saved and entering the church. And other people, enraged, jealous, fuming, attacking the Christians, beating them up, putting them in prison. That's the power. It means it ha it's having an effect in the world. That is gospel power. And he says, in the Holy Spirit. Because the whole gospel preaching and any hope of power is powerless is hopeless if the word preached does not come with 
the Holy Spirit's empowerment. <coughs> it is true that the word is powerless. It remains the letter that kills, as Paul says, if the Spirit does not bring it to life. The Holy Spirit is the, the member of the Godhead who opens people's eyes to believe the gospel. And so if the gospel comes and people are not made alive by the Spirit, then it only enrages them and turns them into enemies. But where the Holy Spirit accompanies the gospel being powerfully preached, it has powerful effects to bring lost sinners to life, to make enemies children, to make sinners the guilty, the criminals against God, righteous. The Holy Spirit is our only hope, and He is none less than the infinite God empowering our preaching. And when the Holy Spirit does so, the rest of verse 5 tells us that when He does so, when He empowers gospel preaching, it comes with full conviction. End of the sentence. When, when, we, when, when the gospel is rightly preached with the Holy Spirit's power, it brings about an assurance of truth that those who hear it as the Holy Spirit enlightens their mind, gives life to their soul, and opens their ear to hear the word of the living God. There becomes an assurance that this is truth. This is worth believing. And so they repented from sin. They put aside their whole old life the whole old way of, of, of religious pagan idolatry or others left their synagogue worship, left their way of, of associating only with the Jews and now became Christian Jews. A complete change of life. They were willing to do that because of the assurance that comes with Holy Spirit empowered preaching of the gospel. And so we see that others reject this conviction that comes in their heart, but they hate it. They reject it, they suppress the truth, they oppose the gospel. Whereas others accept it, repent of their sins, and believe the gospel. Both happened in Thessalonica. Gospel preaching demands one of those responses. When, when the Holy Spirit empowers gospel preaching, you can't just sit there and go, huh, interesting theory, I like it, nice, sounds good for them, we don't care. No, this is true gospel, truth, eternally true, applied to everybody. No one escapes it. No matter where you are, the gospel is true for you and to you. And until you believe it by faith in Jesus Christ, you will be condemned by it. And a response is necessary to either believe or to reject and suppress. I want to ask, as as we conclude and look back, what, what the gospel power does is turn these opposing sinful people into those who have genuine works of faith, beautiful labor of love, and an everlasting endurance in hope that as God's chosen ones come to faith through the gospel being preached. I want to ask you, have you repented of your sin? Have you turned away from your unrighteousness and come to live under Christ's rule, in righteousness, have you, knowing all of your guilt and all of your sin, looked to Christ with empty hands, nothing to offer, no goodness, no beauty, no obedience about you whatsoever. You look to Him for grace and grace alone, and so He pours it upon you. Have you done that? I call you to do that. Do not be like those in Thessalonica who were not a part of this letter, were not a part of the church because they rejected it. Jealous, they loved other things, they hated the truth, whatever it was. Believe today on Jesus Christ. Believe that he can save you because he can. And friends, I want to say to Christians, do you trust that the gospel is the power to salvation for anyone who believes? Or are you spending your time trying to convince your friends to become a Christian because there's great perks, Church is nice. We have good coffee. Uh, you know, friendly people. You know, your, your life could have some additives. You know, Jesus could really help you out in your life. Don't, don't use any of those sweeteners to try and get people to Christ. The power for them. What you must give to them so that they may 
born again is the simple gospel truth. Whether it's shared over a coffee, whether it's written in a letter, whether it's talked about back and forth at the uh, bubbler at work over and over and over again, as it's over an email, over a phone call, whatever it is, or whether it's through gospel preaching from a stage in a church, any of those things, God empowers it. God wants to empower you as an evangelist in your world. The gospel has that power that is needed. And I want to ask you, where do you run? Christian, where do you run when you need assurance? When you feel like you've given into temptation, when you've, you've failed again, when you've been a coward, when you've yelled at your family again, when you've given into that, uh, that, that anger, when you've gossiped yet again, when you've, you, you've, you've been ungenerous and you, you missed an opportunity to help, what do you do? Do you run to the law? Do you run to your old way of thinking that if you obey enough, fix enough, do enough, God will be happy with you again? Do you try and just beat yourself down with the law? Do you try and, try and do enough in order to get your assurance back? Or do you go practically, intentionally, remind yourself of the gospel truth of Jesus Christ? Because in that gospel, being remembered, there is power to the soul. There is refreshing to the sinner. There is energy in your spirit that comes from the gospel. No, nothing physical, nothing tingly, not promising that, not even promising emotions. I'm promising a sense of gospel assurance. I want to pray over us before we finish our sermon and Paul, uh, Paul. Vic prays the doxology over us. Father God, we are just like the Thessalonians. Many of us are, and we thank you for this, God, in our church, quite young in the faith, that you keep saving people, and we thank you for that, for bringing them to us. God, we thank you that we have quite a mix of people in, in age, race, culture, economy. God, we thank you that, that you have brought us through troubled waters before, but we are definitely standing in your gospel, and that is you to be praised for. We thank you for the similarities we can look at in Thessalonians. We thank you for the example they give and the exhortation that you give to us through this book. Through the Apostle Paul, just as he wrote to his beloved brothers and sisters back then, we feel and hear his love through these pages. And we see your fatherly hand, O oh God, speaking to us, reminding us, rebuking us. Lead us out of our sin. Lead us into fullness of obedience. And for those who are not yet Christians, Lord, lead them out of their sins and into faith to believe and then lead them out of their lifestyle of sin. May we, God, trust no other ground, look to no other source of strength than you for us in Christ for the gospel. Bless all of this to your glory and the fame of your name. We love you, Lord, and thank you for the word. Amen. Well, thank you for that, that word, Tom, uh, always encouraging, and uh, we just trust that Lord will use that word to bless and encourage you, every one of you who are out there watching. And as we now sort of go our own ways, our doxology comes from the um, book of Numbers. It is the, the Aaronic blessing, the beautiful Aaronic blessing, and it starts in verse 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel, and you shall say to them. And, and I say this to us as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So we leave you with that. We, we trust that uh, you will have a great week coming up that in all of these things lord that you will see the lord at work and that you will be blessed and encouraged keep in touch with each other and uh, we trust that we will catch up with you either during the week or again next sunday god bless each one of you